Shadows to Life, Chapter 1, When It Rains, It Burns, September 20th, Morning, Two Months Earlier. Damien flipped up the hood of his duffel coat and exited the SkyTrain station, heading towards the Howard Chen Crisis Center for boys and girls. It was raining again, and he didn't want the water to mess up his meticulously sculpted hair. Not today. Today was almost certainly a meeting day, the first one in a while. And on meeting days, everything had to be perfect, no matter what. Of course, it might turn out that Days was just keeping Damien on his toes. He had a habit of doing just that, and hadn't mentioned anything when Damien was at the crisis center the day before for the weekly meeting. But then, he never did, even when he knew for certain that Damien would have to go to the bank. Soldier B should be ever vigilant, always ready, he'd say. At least the city was still, quieter than normal. There were hardly any cars on the road, and the few pedestrians that were out had their heads down and under umbrellas. Damien enjoyed the relative solitude. It gave off the feeling of being alone, and helped him mentally prepare for his audience with Howard, the man whose approval or anger governed his fate, his entire world. Yanking the heavy door open with one hand, Damien walked underneath the teal sign to his prison away from home. Even after all these years, the black letters appeared shiny and new, as did everything with Howard Chen's name attached. The sign did a good job of hiding the true nature of what lay inside. Damien could feel the malevolent marrow of the building wrap around him like a rain-soaked cloak as he entered. The interior was the same as always. Dark, but not like the night. Rather, as if it had been sucked out, robbed of it, not missing. Near the ceiling clung the usual haze of smoke, a mist barely noticeable except under the right light. Everything inside had a tarnished, worn feel to it, including Damien, whenever he visited. Man, he thought, if anyone found out about the conditions inside this place, the media would have a field day. But then, they can't find out, can they? And honestly, Damien wasn't sure if he wanted them in or not. It didn't affect him anymore. So who cares, right? And the wards that prevented normals from coming inside did allow for a certain amount of privacy. Damien entertained the thought about what it would be like if general society knew about the existence of siphons and vassals. Two secret organizations that fought for control over their cities. He pursed his lips. It seemed impossible to imagine, and basically the same as if he suddenly found out that vampires and werewolves were real. Though, after everything he'd seen, he supposed that it wouldn't shock him all that much. Another great thing about the wards in the front of the crisis center, he thought, bringing his mind back to them, was that they prevented vassal assholes from entering. Sure, he never really had to deal with them all that much anyway, and maybe prevented wasn't exactly the right word, but still, at the end of the day, it was good to know that they were there. The way Damien heard it, the wards were like tear gas or something, extremely unpleasant to them, and they shut down their powers practically all the way. Or at least, that was the rumor. Impossible to know since, to Damien's knowledge, no vassal had ever entered. As the heavy door clicked shut behind him, a few of the younger initiates popped their heads out to see who had come in. Damien eyed them dangerously as he passed. The little cockroaches would never think of trying something stupid like picking a fight, but an extra layer of intimidation wouldn't hurt. They were the kinds of habits which had allowed Damien to survive the crisis center when he'd lived here. Some of the teens looked at him with awe as he passed, some just with caution, but all feared him. To them, he was the one allowed to live alone, Howard's privileged assassin and go-to. Toward the stairs, Damien noticed one of the older kids step out in his way, yawning broadly like he didn't notice Damien's approach. The boy had probably just started getting a handle on his powers and wanted to prove that he wasn't afraid, that he was better than the others. Tisk, tisk, tisk. You do know you have to put him in his place, I assume. 
A grin snaked across Damien's lips as he nodded at Leech's words, noticing that none of the other kids even bothered to warn the young man of his impending ass-kicking. It was hardly surprising, of course. The crisis center was law of the jungle. Only the clever and merciless survived. The boy should have long ago learned the lesson Damien was about to teach him, and that any sign of defiance was simply not tolerated. Drawing his power from Leech, Damien leaned forward and pictured where he wanted to go, then teleported past the boy. Without looking back, Damien grabbed the kid's hair and slammed him into the adjacent wall. Little crap sack's jaw made a popping sound on impact, and he slumped to the floor, unconscious. Damien allowed himself an evil, taunting smile as he looked back at the remaining teens. Know your place, he said, then continued to walk casually, slowly towards the stairs. His turned back was a dare, an open challenge. That's it? You let him off easy? What would Fitty have done? Or Burns? The statement stopped Damien in his tracks and he paused to contemplate Leech's words. His shadow made a good point. Next time it might be a knife in the back, or poison in his drink. Without warning, Damien turned and stalked back towards the fallen teen. The other kids scattered like carrion before a lion. Damien raised his foot, about to bring it crashing down on the worthless initiate's neck. But something stayed him. He didn't know what. What are you waiting for? Do it! Damien lowered his boot. Not onto the child, but back to the floor. You're right, Leech. The moment has passed. And if I kill him now, I can't torture him later. What are you talking about? The moment hasn't... Oh, I see. Fine, then. Let the injured jaw serve as a warning for those who would try to claim your spot at the top. It's for their sake as much as yours, if you think about it. Damien nodded and entered the stairwell. Leech's words rang true. A harder lesson for one of them probably would mean fewer lessons in total. It is for their sake. As he did every time he descended the stairs, Damien looked up at the painting hung above the stairwell a cave lit by moonlight. Inside the cave were two dots, most likely meant to be eyes. The picture stirred painful memories, himself in a straitjacket inside a holding cell on suicide watch, Leech's first words that had seemed to come from the dark hallway through the bars into his cell. Damien. Who is that? Damien had called out, though he hadn't been known as Damien at the time. Who are you talking to? I'm talking to you, Damien. He would thought he was going crazy. It was hard not to wearing a straitjacket. I'm not Damien. L- leave me alone. No, I suppose you're not Damien. But you could be. Damien shivered and shook his head, teleporting him back into the present. The painting with its golden ornate frame mirrored the building in which it was housed, a domicile which held forgotten treasures as a side benefit. It also mirrored the man who bought such a building and used it for his crisis center that was nothing more than a dormitory for his initiates and siphons, a man who looked shiny and nice on the outside, but contained an inner coating of malevolence. The crisis center was like a cross between an old British mansion and a Masonic temple. Even after living for years in the dorm, Damien still had no clue what the building had been used for before it was taken over by Howard's company. One thing for sure was, whoever had owned it must have been wealthy in the extreme. The stairs alone had huge, oversized railings with intricate, gargoyle-like creatures carved into the wood, inlaid with gold and silver not to mention the paintings inherited with the building, all of them seemingly a hundred years before his time, and all sporting lavish, expensive-looking frames. Last but not least, a dazzling crystal chandelier hung over the bottom landing of the stairs. It was like someone was trying to prove how many expensive decorations they could cram into the place and still fit people inside. Damien exited the stairs, now one story below street level, making his way through the spacious foyer and TV room. 
He headed towards the back where Daze's office and room was located in the far corner of the building. All the rooms downstairs were bigger and used exclusively for the older kids, who had become siphons like Damien. As usual, Burns emerged from his room to eye Damien enviously as he passed. The youth was two years younger than Damien, with light, strawberry blonde hair and freckles. His vulture shaped neck and cruel mouth were the only visible indicators of his personality. Hey, asshole, Burns said casually. Back from the palace, are we? Damien didn't bother to answer the human vulture. It only made Burns angrier to be ignored, and Damien was already worried about his schedule. Honestly, Damien, you're not going to say anything back? You just dislocated a child's jaw over far less. Damien gave an almost imperceptible shake of his head to answer Leech. Burns wasn't some throwaway that might never develop real powers. He was a full-fledged siphon, capable of going out on missions. More importantly, he was an asset of the organization. If Damien incapacitated Burns, without good reason, Days would do far worse to Damien than Damien had done to the little twerp upstairs. But apparently, Burns wasn't going to let it go either. I know why you're here. It's to visit your little charity project, isn't it? You know, Damien, I've always wondered. She letting you tap that ass in return? And just like that, Burns had crossed the line. Two comments challenging Damien's reputation in a row would be enough to get him the beating he sorely needed. But mentioning Scratch, after being warned the last time, and doing it loud enough for the entire floor to hear... Burns hadn't just stepped over the line, he jumped. Damien snarled and hopped into the air, just high enough to break inertia and allow him to teleport. The Burns that had been talking to him didn't react to either the snarl or the jump, telling Damien that what he saw wasn't actually Burns at all, but rather one of his pride illusions. Blinking forward and past the felonious copy, Damien passed through the opening in the door and was unsurprised to find himself surrounded by five more identical copies of Burns, one of which would be the real one. Instantly, one of the illusions jumped forward without hesitation, lining up a huge front kick aimed at Damien's head. This was the general strategy of a pride specialist. Each copy would attack in turn, forcing their opponent to either react or do nothing. But within the group would be a real attacker, the illusion creator, who, when given an opening, would attack simultaneously at the unprotected areas of his opponent's body. Unable to block everything, a gifted pride illusionist was a dangerous foe. Or rather, Damien reflected, should be a dangerous foe. Burns pulled the same trick every time they fought. Damien simply did as he always did, and blinked straight at the real Burns, putting his whole body behind his punch. Burns' head ricocheted off the wall with a heavy thump, and he fell to the ground, dripping blood before his body even landed. He clutched the side of his head on all fours as a small red pool gathered beneath him. Demian would have slit the weasel's throat if Howard hadn't forbidden his siphons from killing each other. How do you always know which one I am? Burns growled through clenched teeth. Damien was impressed that the dick could still think straight after the blow he'd just been dealt, but it didn't change anything. Burns was still his rival, and the person he liked least in the world. Damien let out a long, taunting belly laugh. Not because he found Burns' stupidity funny, even though he did. But like everything else Damien did, he had a reason. This was simple tactics. The point being to make Burns angrier, and feed Leech, his shadow, all at once. Oh, that is delicious. I'm so glad this fool was here. Damien would never dream of revealing to Burns his subtle tell of stepping slightly further back from his opponent than his illusions. Surprisingly fearful given his specialty. And that as long as Damien had a fraction of a second to examine the position of the clones, he would always know which vulture was the real one. Salt the Wound Damien nodded and crouched down to whisper in Burns' ear. You may be the second best operative here, but there's a world of power you know nothing about. With that, Damien stood back up and headed towards the door. 
That's it. He taunted you in front of everyone, and even added to the rumors about you and Scratch. Don't be such a coward. Damien snarled at the insult, but turned around. Leech was right, as usual. Damien leaned back down. I know you only pull this shit here in the dorm, where you know you're safe, he said, in as taunting a manner as he could manage. But if you ever do that out in the city, where no one will know what happened, I'll make sure you suffer before I kill. Burns chuckled slightly as he interrupted. <laughs> I knew you were too chicken shit to... Damien took one step forward, summoning Wrath in mid-motion, and kicked Burns in the crotch from behind so hard it lifted him off the ground. Burns let out a strangled gasp and collapsed onto his side, holding his groin in silent agony. I told you he needed a lesson. Damien stepped over him and looked down with calculated condescension. As I was saying, if you ever pull anything like that out where I think I can get away with it, I'll make sure you suffer until you pray for death as a sweet release it will be. Damien tried to sound bored, like Burns was so far beneath him he wasn't even worried. More tactics. He left the room with one last taunting, condescending smile on his way out. You should have done more. Shut up, Leech, Damien whispered, loud enough so only his shadow could hear. You know I can't hurt Burns badly enough that it stops him from carrying out a mission. Damien heard Leech give a spine-crawling laugh, the only way he seemed to know how. I doubt he'll be going on a mission anyway. Besides, Days broke Scabs' arm not even a year ago. Pfft, Damien scoffed. First of all, he's Days. And second, Scabs isn't even a siphon yet. She's still an initiate. Not to mention the fact that we don't even know what Howard said to Days after he did that. Hmm. Yes, Days certainly wasn't himself for a while, was he? Damien nodded. Exactly. If Burns turns down a mission without a visible injury, then he'll be the one who gets in trouble. Not us. Leech let out another laugh, and Damien forced himself not to cringe. Smart, Damien. Very smart. I like it when you find new and interesting ways to be cruel. Damien laughed out loud as he continued on toward Daze's room, knowing that insanity would only make the other siphons and initiates more afraid of him. Leech could be a dick sometimes, but at least he was good company. Thanks again for listening to another chapter of Shadows to Life. Please support by following me on Twitter, at Rob V. Johnson, and by subscribing and liking the podcast. See you next time.